Well, good afternoon. I want to first of all thank uh, our musicians, uh, Kenneth Watson and, and, the, and the drummer, and Caitlin, who uh, did a beautiful, beautiful voice and was singing. And thank you for setting the mood for us. So, everybody feeling chill right now, right? Y'all mellow. And food is good. All right. I want to thank everyone for attending, of course. Uh, this is our 10th. Black History uh, Celebration with the Ramsey County and the City of St. Paul. So I just want to thank our, the leadership of uh, both the county and the city for creating an environment where we can have something like this on a regular basis and supporting us the way they do. So let's give the county and the city a, a hand. Also want to thank uh, Faye's Homestyle Catering for the wonderful food. Hopefully everyone has got a chance to, to taste that already. And... Um, we're gathered here today to, to celebrate our youth. So our theme of today is, is our black youth, uh, resistance and resilience. And we have, a, I think, a, a great program prepared for you. We're going to have various artists come up and, and share their gifts. And then we'll, we'll hear what uh, Professor Harris has to say about the issue. So I'm looking forward to the discussion today. So I want to get this off started by uh, welcoming Lacey Dreams up to come and lead us in the Black National Anthem. Now that's everyone to stand at this time. Lift every voice and sing Till earth and heaven ring Ring with the harmonies Of liberty Let our rejoicings Rise as a listening skies let it resound loud as the rolling sea. <laughs> Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun, let us march on till victory is won. Stony the road we trod, bitter the chastening rod, felt in the days when hope unborn had died, yet with the steady beat, have not a weary feet. Come to a place for which I fall sigh. <laughs> we have come over a way that with tears has been watered. We have come treading our path through the blood of the slaughter. Out from the gloomy past till now we stand at last Where the white gleam of our bright star is cast God of our weary years God of our silent tears Thou who has brought us thus far on the way, Thou who 
was by thy might Led us into the light Keep us forever in the path We pray Last our feet Straight from the places, our God, where we met thee. Last our hearts, drunk with the wine of the world, we forget thee. Shadow beneath thy head, may we forever stand. True to our God, true to our native land, true to our God, true to our native land, true to our God, true to our native land. I want to thank you, Lacey, for that beautiful rendition of the Black National Anthem. At this time, I would like to welcome up Commissioner Tony Carter to deliver the Black History Month proclamation. Thank you. Thank you, and good afternoon, all. It's a blessing to be in your company today and to be able to share with you in this celebration of black history entitled Our Black Youth, Resistance and Resilience. I just want to thank again the committee of folks who have come together to make this opportunity available to us. And I have to thank all of you for making it important by being here. I'm always reminded of that Sankofa bird who reminds us of how important it is to look backwards to know how to plan our feet forward. And so this is an opportunity to do both. I'm excited about the folks who are here with us today. Uh, thank you to those who just led us in the singing of the Black National Anthem. And a special treat, of course, will be to hear from guest speakers in spoken word and in presentation today. So thank you so much for being here with us. I have the opportunity to read a proclamation that was read into the record at the Ramsey County Board of Commissioners just this past Tuesday. It is ours to celebrate with you, and our proclamation reads, whereas... In 1926, Dr. Carter Godwin Woodson launched the celebration of Negro History Week. And whereas February 1986 marked the beginning of National Black History Month to honor, recognize, promote, and preserve black history and culture. And whereas the theme for the 2019 Ramsey County and City of St. Paul Black History Month program is our Black Youth, Resistance and Resilience, and whereas Ramsey County commits to advancing racial equity, where race can no longer be used to predict outcomes, and where outcomes for all are improved. And whereas Ramsey County recognizes, supports, and respects our Black youth in strategic priorities, in our policies, programs, and services, and partnerships, and other ways, and whereas black youth have and continue to set many notable historic and contemporary examples as a powerful force for social change nationally and locally, formally and informally, civilly, politically and academically, to shape a future that secures fundamental rights of self-determination and racial justice. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed, the Ramsey County Board of Commissioners recognizes February as Black History Month in Ramsey County, and be it further proclaimed, the Ramsey County Board of Commissioners urges all Ramsey County employees and residents to honor, to celebrate, and to, to support Black youth of today as they, too, are called to action. So it is a pleasure and an honor 
to have read that proclamation to you and to have had it read into our record at the Ramsey County Board of Commissioners once again. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Carter. At this time, we're going to move on in our program, and I'm going to invite uh, Tish Jones to come up and share with us some... Oh, well, hold up. Too soon. <laughs> Too soon. Always on time. My mayor has showed up. Always on time. Yeah, well, you know, we're going to keep, we're going to keep it right up in here. But <laughs> Well, I just want to, uh, at this time... Get out the way and let our mayor come up and share some remarks. So, Mayor Melvin Carter III. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. It is good to be here. I'm sorry I was running late. I literally ran down the stairs when I heard that my mother was already speaking. And so I feel bad to have missed my mother's comments, but she was somewhere I was speaking yesterday and she left early, so I figure we're even. <laughs> I'm Melvin Carter, and I have the privilege of serving as mayor of the most incredible city on the planet. And the reason I know this is the most incredible city on the planet is because every single day, I get to meet the people who live in this community. I get to meet the people who are raising their children and creating businesses and launching amazing ideas in this community uh, every single day. And you know, it's, it's interesting because you run for mayor because you think you know something about a community. And then in the process of campaigning, you learn even more. And then in the process of having been uh, the mayor of this city for a year, you learn even more. And you know, I've learned a couple things. One, when I ask people why they choose to live here, why they plant their families here, why they launch their careers here, why they you know, plant their businesses here, the, the, the magnitude of the dreams that I hear from people every day that they've planted in St. Paul, what, what, what they believe can happen in St. Paul, in Ramsey County, too often outsizes. It's way bigger than the dreams that we dare to dream from City Hall. And I've also learned, though, as I've gotten a chance, you know, I'm a hands-on learner. So I like to visit the rec centers, and I like to go out on the trucks and repave some roads with our, with our public works folks. Uh, a couple weeks ago, we had a snowstorm, and I was out at about 11 o'clock at night pressure washing a, 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 a snowplow truck. Uh, and I get a chance to engage directly with our staff in all of our departments. And what amazes me, uh, there's literally not been a, a day that has gone by when I've been the mayor, when the passion, when the energy, when the commitment, uh, when the skill, when the capacity and the capabilities uh, of our city employees, of our public workers, of our county employees, of the, of the folks who do the work, like the hands-on work day to day in and out, uh, it doesn't amaze me. I mean, it's incredible. You know, we're, we're one of those Rondo families if you know the history of Old Rondo, that's the community that was the thriving African-American community who was uprooted to build the freeway. I have, uh, we have in our family's possession uh, deeds of our properties, seven of them, with Rondo Avenue addresses. And those deeds aren't worth the paper they're printed on. And the reason we're not is because somewhere along the way, we decided that our community at large needed a freeway. And Rondo Avenue was the thriving African-American community that was uprooted to build that freeway. And my family's inheritance and so many others were gutted to build that freeway. I say that to say this. Um, I believe that, I, I don't think that there was a, any like dimly lit, smoke-filled room of people who were trying to figure out how to get the Rondo community. I think more accurately what happened was uh, somebody said, we need a freeway. And they said, well, let's build it here. And some community with agency and power stood up and said, no, no, no we live here, not, not, not here. And they said, well, let's maybe build it here. And some other community with agency and power stood up and said, no, 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 not here, we live here. And then they said, let's build it here. And when they found Rondo, they found a community whose agency and power had been stripped from it. 
very intentionally for a very long time. And so when I think about the fact that we live in a community, we live in a state where we can still uh, more accurately predict a child who's born in our community, their, her, her, her expected life outcomes based on her race and her zip code than we can based on her work ethic. We gotta ask ourselves why. And I think it's the inevitable result, maybe the obvious result of decades and generations of uh, policy and resource decision making that has happened without all the voices at the table. And so our goal is to build a city that works for all of us. And I always remind folks that doing that will require all of us to get a chance to do some of the building. We've made a lot of changes over the past year. At the end of the year, one of the uh, city hall reporters looked at me and recounted that we've raised the minimum wage and we've funded bike lanes and we've you know invested in housing. We've done all these things that we've done. We've done it the, just a different way. And he said, that's a lot of change. I said, well, listen, I've been mayor for a year. And before that, I spent two years running. And the one, look, people say anything to you when you run for office. They will say anything. The one thing that nobody's ever said to me is keep St. Paul the same. Our job is to change our community, even more so when we raise the minimum wage or when we establish legal defense fund for immigrants and refugees or when, you know, when, when we're talking about financial empowerment or whatever we do, somebody always comes to me and they say, look, mayor, I agree with what you're saying. Of course, families need help getting out of poverty and making their money work for them. Of course, families in our community are being targeted by ICE and that's not fair and they feel threatened by that. Of course, families in our community work full time and they're stuck living, raising their kids in poverty. Of course, the city like has a stake and, and, and it's important to us that our kids get an education. And then they ask the question, but is this the proper role of city government? And let me tell you, there's no question that angers me more than that. And the reason is because somewhere along the way, if we ask that question, if we even just buy into the premise behind that question, we're, what, we're, what we're saying is the role of city government is more, the role of government, the role of community is more dependent on repeating the same old things we've always done than on finding new ways to create new solutions to the new challenges our residents face. I know that that's not true though, because our public employees, you're the ones who see those residents day in and day out. You're the ones who work with those residents in our rec centers and our communities. Uh, and when they come in to apply for a, a permit, you know, out, out, on the, out in the neighborhoods and out on the streets. And one of our goals, one of our central goals is gonna be to take the experiences that you have the things that you hear, the ideas, the innovative concepts that you have, and connect them to the policy making work that we do here on the third floor and on the second floor. A simple example of that is fine free libraries. Did you see we eliminated li late fees in our libraries here? That's such a simple concept. And I'll tell you one thing, that is one thing, it's just two teams. It either makes you happy or it angers you to no end. <laughs> But we've learned about late fees. We've learned about late fees. Look, they, one, they don't make people bring their books back. They make people stay away from the library. Raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Two, we've learned that people on one side of town don't bring books back later than people on the other side of town. But for some of us, a $12 late fee is an inconvenience and a frustration. For other of us, it's dinner for our children. We gotta think on that kind of fundamental level. I see Council Member uh, Misha Jalali Nelson, thank you, or for Council Member for being here with us. I wanna acknowledge you as part of our critical change team. Uh, but look, I wanna let you know, I see my job, I see my role as supporting all of you in the room. I see my job in, you know, usually people uh, don't come into public service uh, for the fame or the fortune, right? That was a joke. <laughs> And everybody's in this room because of a set of passions that put you in this room. Everybody's in this room because you believe the world should be a certain way. And you believe that you can do something about it. And you believe that you can make an impact. I see uh, Ward 7 uh, Council Member Jane Prince here as well. It's good to see you. And our job, those elected leaders of us, our job uh, is to put the gas in the tank. Our job is to support you in making that big difference in community that you know that we can make when we work together. 
So I'm honored to be your teammate in that work. I'm honored to be here. And I know I haven't spent much time talking about black history. It's important to me, and I grew up in a family that talked a lot about black history, and I learned a lot of things at home that I didn't learn in school. And on occasion, I'd have arguments with my history teachers about those things. And they would tell me, no, that didn't happen. So I'd write a paper about it <laughs> and show that it actually did happen. It's important to me that we see ourselves reflected in that conversation of history. And the reason history is important, the reason history is important, I think is of an important symbol in our culture, which is, which is the Sankofa bird. The Sankofa bird walks forward, but it looks backwards. And the notion is that we understand our history, but not for history's sake. We understand our history because by understanding where we come, that's how we build our best chance to move forward in the way that we want to build it. Thank you for being your, our teammates and building a city that works for all of us. Thank you for being our teammates and make sure, making sure that whatever you do for our, for our public uh, agencies, our city, our county, that you do it in a, in a way uh, that's done uh, with respect, that's done with excellence, that's done in a way that lifts people forward. And thank you for your work to bring those voices, those passions, those needs, those challenges to the forefront so that we can work together to ensure that this truly is a city that works for all of us. Thank you very much. All right. And he finished on time. I couldn't believe it. That was, that was great. That was great. Well, now we get to be uh, uh, hear some great words again in a different format. I'm going to invite Tish Jones to come up and share with us some spoken words. Um, I want to thank everybody that spoke before me, Mrs. Carter. Mr. Carter, Mayor Carter. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm going to do this poem. It was requested by one of my elders in the room. And uh, just on theme, thinking about uh, black youth and resistance, resilience. Mayor Carter talked about um, just a legacy and generations and generations of, um, you know, systemic and strategic thought um, meant to make a certain population of people downtrodden. Yeah. Um, so this poem is about that and about our resilience, specifically young people's resilience. Before I was born, there was movement. Paddles pushing pent up people through oceans of pain. That explains my fear of water. When I was born, there was movement still. Lines, paths, roads, circles, and tracks. Check it. I had my first perm in elementary school. Went from coarse, curly black hair to straight, thin. Then what are you going to do with this dude? After that, I did braids, weaves, ponytails, extensions, this faux hawk, mohawk, ducktail design on the side type thing. Um, but before all of that, I also wore tracks. Then there was high school, St. Paul Central, big gray five floor in a basement building. Kind of looks like a prison, kind of ran like one too. The fifth floor was for the academic acronyms like AP and IB. The fourth floor was for the quest learners, second to the best grade point average earners. The third, well, the third was whatever. The second was past, and the first was us, the theater class. How we were placed in this system, tracks. Pause. Uh, my name is Tish Jones, and I have been called here to represent ancestors whose blood sifts through the palms of my little brother's hands as he plays in the sand, and they bless him. Forefathers who existed before my forefathers and raised men to raise men, hence the sun and the raisin. Then a generation of beautiful black women born and bred to believe that beauty belongs to everyone but them. So they die and they fry and they try to fit in in many ways along with trains to leave tracks in their thighs because the tracks attached to the root of her naps will change to the middle of her back with due self-respect. And she is all right with that. They call her a runner, making laps on laps. Known as a track star, she is right on someone else's track. Then there's the little boy whose father was sent away yesterday. You see, he's having a bad day. He's in the hallway, frustrated, fighting to keep his tears to himself. She walks by. She's smart, skinny, makes failing a test seem hard. If you don't believe me, peep her report card. Anyway, she and he were cool. They went to the same school, hung in the same crew, did things that two best friends would normally do until after taking that test. When he gets labeled advanced, or she gets labeled advanced, and he gets labeled a fool. What does he do? He drops out of school, does what he feels he has to, becomes a star mathematician, a genius in the kitchen, studies how different greens and whites would help with his addition. Financial advisor for women, pimping and flipping. Now, my man fights his tears inside of a prison right next to Pops. Do you feel me? Pause. Forget it. 
Just play track, black boy, or football, or basketball, or just ball, black boy, rob, steal, fail, get money, get girls, and go to jail. You do the same, black girl. Read Cosmo, People, Vibe, and Vixen. Try all your life to find the place that you fit into. You see, I represent broken histories, missing texts from textbooks, kinesthetic learners that don't test good, products of society, 24 hours of good, clean sobriety, a language that I play with because mine was taken in a country that shuns me, and I have so much stake in it. A people who are a direct result of an action taken, and a people who fear those people, so they've created laws to evade and contain them inside of lines, paths, roads, circles, and tracks. My name is Tish Jones, and I have been called here to represent the missing piece. Good luck with this, Duchess. Uh, <laughs> bar just got raised quite a bit. Well, thank you, Tish, for that wonderful performance and for those for speaking truth. Appreciate that. Now I want to uh, introduce our keynote speaker, which is Professor Duchess Harris, and I'm gonna read uh, briefly her her bio. So Duchess Harris is a professor of American studies at McAllister College, author of Black Feminist Politics from Kennedy to Clinton, and co-editor with Bruce B. Baum of Racial Writing the Republic, Races, Race, Rebels, and Transformations of the American Identity. Professor Harris was a, a Mellon Mays Fellow at the University of Pennsylvania. She earned a PhD in American Studies from the University of Minnesota. She did postdoctoral fellowships at the Institute of Race and Poverty at the University of Minnesota Law School and at the Womanist Studies Consortium at the University of Georgia. She earned a Juris Doctorate in January 2011 from William Mitchell College of Law and has an expertise in civil rights law. She was the first chair of the American Studies Department of McAllister College. She is also the curator of the Duchess Harris Collection, which consists of more than 40 books written for three through uh, third through 12th graders. Professor Harris is a scholar of contemporary American, African American history and political theory. And Professor Harris, please take over. And you better bring it. OK, really, Tish? Really? <laughs> what am I supposed to do, y'all? <laughs> I am so glad to be here today. I have to thank my um, good friend, Jeff, um, who provided both intellectual guidance and lots of emotional support when I was a law student at William Mitchell. Um, I have to say I was inspired by the Black National Anthem, which was sung by Lace Dreams. And I need to tell you all that I have a new book out about the history of the Black National Anthem. It's for third to sixth graders. So you guys have to check that out. And um, I try to stand on the shoulders of Commissioner Tony Carter, not just um, in her political leadership, but it seems like she's a pretty good mom. Um, <laughs> and I'm grateful for the mayor for allowing my 12-year-old to be in his recent commercial. Um, so I'm, I'm really glad to be here today. And today I'm going to talk about um, Black Lives Matter. And so um, if we could just get my slides up, that would be great. Okay, beautiful. Okay, thanks so much. So um, I want to publicly thank a woman named Dorothy Toth who does my slides for me. I'm responsible for the content, so any of that you might not like it goes in my direction. But the fact that this is aesthetically pleasing has everything to do with who she is. And so I'm profoundly grateful for that. Um, she is the marketing director um, for my publisher, Abdo Publishing. And when she saw my version of the slides, she said, we don't make them with crayons anymore. <laughs> So I said, OK, let me just um, ask you to do this for me. And so I'll get started by saying that most people know me as an academic. I've been on the faculty at McAllister since um, somewhere in the 90s. And um, that's how people identify me. I have also been deeply involved in the community for the almost 28 years that I have lived here. And one of the things that I currently do is that um, I was 
um, appointed by the former governor, Mark Dayton, to be on the Board of Public Defenders. Um, and I'm very proud of that because I support the work that the public defenders do um, because, you know, they are the advocates um, for people who often do not have representation. And I open up with talking about that because I met with lots of public defenders and shared with them this book about Black Lives Matter, and I've gotten a lot of feedback that they have found it to be useful. So that is how um, I am proud of the fact that lots of times, if you're in the ivory tower, your work sits there and it doesn't go beyond that. And this is the kind of work that actually I feel operates in the community. So to give you an idea of um, what my worldview is, um, as Jeff said, I'm in the American Studies Department, so I'm trained at the intersection of um, legal studies and political theory, um, but also I do history, but I do history in a way that some people don't do it. And so um, I'd like to use a James Baldwin quote to explain how I see history, which is that he said, I contend it is the present. We, with every breath we take, every move we make, are history. And what goes around comes around. OK, so I will get started with the story of my book. So right now, it's 2019. I'm currently on sabbatical. Um, my provost might seem to see this tape. Um, you know, if she were in the room, I'd say there's nothing more that I love than research and teaching, because that's what you're supposed to say, right? She's my boss. OK, the truth of the matter is, if you're a professor, there really is nothing you love more than sabbatical. Um, because I mean, come on. I mean, everyone in this room wants one, right? And so um, it's a wonderful thing. You can take a year off and it gives you time to do some thinking and to reboot. The only thing that's difficult about sabbatical is that you actually have to return. Okay. And so you get like a calendar year to just live your life. And then sometime around the end of July, the beginning of August, you realize, oh my goodness, I'm going to have to go back and see those kids. Not that I don't love them, but you know, you have to readjust your head. And so um, at the beginning of August of 2014, I'd already started to feel some anxiety about the return. And then we had the tragic event that on August 9th, Michael Brown was shot and killed. And as I saw all of the images of Michael Brown's body on the ground, um, it just um, resonated with me on a personal level because of my family, um, my deceased father was black, my husband's black, my sons are black, and I was thinking, what does it mean that black male bodies can lay on the ground like this? So that's what my personal response was. Um, my professional response was, I'm going to have to go back and talk about this. And I knew that it was going to be a challenge, um, given what I teach. So I was slated to teach two different classes. The first one was going to be Introduction to African American Studies. And that was going to take us back to kind of the Reconstruction time period, right? So I mean, supposedly, we wouldn't have to address this. The other one was going to be Race and the Law. And that was just going to be case law. And maybe we weren't going to have to address this. But everyone in this room knows that we were going to have to talk about it. So when I showed up um, to my class, and teaching now is very different because of technology, so students are watching it unfold on their phones, um, which is different than how the world worked in the 90s. And so I pulled every single student I had, and I said, when you were in high school, did you talk about contemporary race relations? And I underscore contemporary because it's different if someone taught you about slavery, right? That's very different than um, if you had conversations about what was actually happening in real time. I did not have one student who had talked about contemporary race relations in high school. And students from McAllister are from all over the world. We brag about the fact that we're a global college, 2,000 students um, from actually 80 countries. Um, but that's the batch I got. And so I worked with it. It was challenging, but we got through fall semester. We went home for winter break. I tried to decompress. When I came back in the spring, I had um, an interesting experience, which was um, my publisher, which I mentioned before, which is called Abdo, which is located in Edina, contacted me. And I'd never had any relationship with them before. And they said, we have a woman from Florissant, Missouri, which is the area where Michael Brown um, had been. And we're going to do a manuscript on Black Lives Matter. We'd like you to be a content consultant. OK, so for people in the room that don't know what that means, you're a fact checker and you get 200 bucks. 
right? But I thought that it would be interesting, and so I said, you know, let me read this manuscript. Um, the more I read it, the more I enjoyed it. Um, my co-author is Sue Bradford Edwards. She's a beautiful writer, but I was bringing um, a historization to it that she didn't bring to it, and also I had some legal analysis. So as I went through it more and more, I asked the publisher if I could be the co-author. They got really nervous, and I couldn't figure out why. And then they finally said, well, we've already paid her. Um, similar to the mayor, um, when you are in academia, it is neither for fame nor fortune. And so I said, oh, oh, money. I didn't want money. I just want my name on the jacket. And so when they realized that was the case, I became the co-author of this book for 6th to 12th graders on Black Lives Matter. Um, we finished it up in about July of 2015. And then I asked um, then Congressman Keith Ellison to write the introduction. I was very proud of it. I told McAllister about it. And the head of um, media relations at McAllister found a slot for me to be on TPT Almanac. So um, as we know, the mayor at the time was um, Chris Coleman of St. Paul. Betsy Hodges was the mayor of Minneapolis. They were slated to talk about their budgets, but there wasn't a lot of news going on at the time. So I got about seven minutes. And you know, if you're not Toni Morrison, that's a lot of airtime. So I was delighted. Friday night, as you know, live, um, I will admit, I was kind of feeling myself. I was like, this is amazing. Um, this is, you know, book launch. I couldn't even have paid for this. Now, I should have known better because if you deal with race relations at all um, and you get excited, that's probably not a good idea. And so um, in my mind over the weekend, I was thinking, what could possibly go wrong? Um, that wasn't a really good thing to think. And so in the wee hours of the morning on Monday, I heard from my co-author, Sue Bradford Edwards, who sent me um, a link and said, did you see this? She sent it to me. I didn't even realize it was about us, but it was. And what it was is a story that was done by um, TV pundit Larry Elder, who um, is a social conservative, as you can see, African-American. He's a correspondent for um, Fox News and Friends. And he did an entire segment that said, this book is indoctrinating children to believe that black people are victims and white people should feel guilty about it. Now, I'll be honest with you, I'm like nearly blind without my glasses on. It was the middle of the night. I didn't have them on. I didn't know why she sent it to me until I realized my entire laptop screen was filled up with my headshot from McAllister. And then I said, oh my goodness, they're talking about me. Now, the reason why I didn't realize they were talking about me is because they were talking about this book and there was no book. Okay, the reason why there's no book is because if you know anything about um, publishing, it's only August. Not only have we not gone to the galleys, we haven't picked the photos, we haven't picked the captions, it hasn't been laid out. Um, it's really in design and in production. And the book's not supposed to come out until January 2016. And so what happens then is that we end up in a cyber war in Twitter space. And so you have all the conservatives saying, you know, this is what's wrong with them, and this is how we need to get our America back, which, you know, I didn't understand that at the time. Um, but then, honestly, a lot of the liberals said, you know, that's unfair. It's the most brilliant thing I've ever read, which I could have taken personally, except for the fact that it really isn't a book yet. And so um, given all of that, my publishers, whom I still have not met, decide that they're going to rush it, and it ends up coming out in October. It comes out early, and it ends up actually being um, their number one selling book for that year, and it ended up being incredibly successful. So this is the jacket cover of the book. Um, I have to brag a little bit. I was um, online yesterday, and I saw Elaine Brown, who's the only woman who led the Panther Party, giving a talk at a school. And the book was propped up behind her, and I almost cried, because I was like, look how far my book has come. And that, of course, is an image um, at a Freddie Gray protest in Baltimore. So as the accusations came out about um, you know, what the book was doing and wasn't doing, I felt like um, I had to, of course, go on the record and say that it's not about indoctrinating white school children. Um, and if you live in Minnesota, even if you're a person of color, you know that um, your kids have, you know, 
many times, many, many, or even in my case, mostly white friends. And so that is not what the agenda of this is at all. Um, the agenda was to underscore the fact that where Michael Brown body, Michael Brown's body was on the ground is, you know, very near the place where Dred Scott was from. And that was the perspective that I was trying to bring to this book, that this is a full circle moment and that, um, you know, what happened with Dred Scott in that case isn't really, you know, that different from where we are with Michael Brown. And so I wanted to um, share this clip with you from a Melissa Harris Perry episode who underscores this relationship between Dred Scott and Michael Brown. In the past decade alone, January 24th, 2004, Timothy Stansberry, Brooklyn, New York, unarmed. November 25th, 2006, Sean Bell, Queens, New York, unarmed. January 1, 2009, Oscar Grant, Oakland, California, unarmed. Jan I'm just gonna get a little louder for you. In the past decade alone, January 24th, 2004, Timothy Stansberry, Brooklyn, New York, unarmed. November 25th, 2006, Sean Bell, Queens, New York, unarmed. January 1, 2009, Oscar Grant, Oakland, California, unarmed. January 29th, 2010, Aaron Campbell, Portland, Oregon, unarmed. July 18th, 2011, Alonzo Ashley, Denver, Colorado, unarmed. March 7th, 2012, Wendell Allen, New Orleans, Louisiana, unarmed. September 14th, 2013, Jonathan Farrell, Charlotte, North Carolina, unarmed. July 17th, 2014, Eric Garner, Staten Island, New York, unarmed. August 9th, 2014, Michael Brown, Ferguson, Missouri, unarmed. In the past decade alone, these men and hundreds of others have lost their lives to police. Local police report to the FBI, killing at least 400 people a year. From 2006 to 2012, a white police officer killed a black person at least twice a week in this country. Which brings us back to Ferguson, Missouri. According to a report in the Daily Beast, in 2009, police officers charged a man for property damage because he bled on their uniforms while they arrested him and allegedly beat him bloody. Ferguson, Missouri, where it took six days to release the name of an officer who shot an unarmed teenager to death. Ferguson, Missouri, where police released images of someone who might be Michael Brown involved in a store robbery and then hours later said the robbery had nothing to do with why Michael Brown was stopped by the police officer who killed him. Ferguson is just outside St. Louis, Missouri, the place where, as historian Blair Kelly reminded us this week in The Root, Dred Scott sued for his freedom on the grounds that he and his wife had for three years, had for many years, lived in a free state. His case eventually went to the Supreme Court, and in 1857, Chief Justice Roger Taney declared that Scott had no right to sue because, as a black man, he was never intended to be an American. Speaking on the clause in the Declaration of Independence that all men are created equal, Taney wrote, quote, it is too clear for dispute that the enslaved African race were not intended to be included and formed no part of the people who framed and adopted this declaration. And he went on to say that black men had no rights, which the white man was bound to respect. No rights, which the white man was bound to respect. No rights, which the white man was bound to respect. No rights, which the white man was bound to respect. A 
Okay, so that is really what the premise of the book is. The premise of the book is to connect, as Baldwin would say, today with history. Um, I might need a little assistance here to be able to scroll this down. And so the way that the book is framed is I set it up in these different historical moments so that we can understand how we get the unfolding of Black Lives Matter. There we go. Yep, excellent, all right. And so the way that I would like people to think about this is that if we frame from Reconstruction to Brown versus Board of Education, that is a moment where we can talk about hope and despair. The hope obviously is emancipation. Right? The despair, however, is the least taught area of American history, which is Reconstruction. And I underscore that by saying that even if you go to the African American Smithsonian, Reconstruction is the area where they actually have a screen and a documentary, and they're talking about this period of history. And it's partly because this is a very difficult period of history to unfold because people haven't found all of the materials yet to talk about the resistance that we had once we were no longer enslaved. And so this is something that people who don't do this for a living, they might not think about a lot, but there's lots of stuff about slavery, right? And then there's plenty of stuff like when you get to the contemporary civil rights movement. But this notion here where we are like stuck in segregation and trying to fight back with that in the early years, that is somewhat missing. Okay, if you move up to what you know we would call the contemporary civil rights movement, we frame that up to Bill Clinton's administration, once again, you have hope and despair. And so the hope that I wanted to frame this around, it's not necessarily you know just what was done for us in terms of legislation, and legislation is important. You get the Civil Rights Act of 64, which gets rid of discrimination, and the Housing Rights Act of 68, but I thought it was important to talk about the politics within the community, the work that people did for themselves. That's often the unwritten story, the unwritten narrative of what people did in terms of black feminism, a black arts movement, and a black power movement. Uh, right, exactly, yeah. So this is Mexico City Olympics, and this is in the 60s, and this is when you have two of the medalists um, standing up with the Black Power Fist. Now, what's important about this is that it's very easy for us to look at this now and romanticize this and think about what a wonderful moment this was. Um, this was actually met with tremendous resistance from the nation. These men were considered to be anti-American, and um, one of them even had so much conflict around this in his personal life, his wife actually left him. And Part of that has to do with the fact that once you take this level of resistance, you're going to get death threats. Um, I can say when my book came out, I got death threats. Um, people were very upset um, that I had the audacity to try to even talk about a movement that was happening and also trying to translate it for young people because as we know, there are people that don't want young people to think about these things, talk about these things, or to understand them. So the resistance, of course, that comes after the civil rights movement is that you have all of this explosion of like, you know, art and the 60s and the 70s and organizing. Well, when you enter the Reagan and Bush administrations, there's plenty of pushback to what had been, you know, some level of cultural prosperity. Now, this isn't a partisan talk. This isn't like, you know, this is what the Republicans did because I'm actually going to talk about the Democrats in the next slide. I'm just going through the historical moment to demonstrate that often when you have great gains, right, and if you think about the eight years that we had recently, then sometimes you can also get some resistance. And that can be traced for centuries. And so if we move forward here, um, a lot of people when Clinton became president thought in many ways he was going to be a savior. Um, you know, um, Toni Morrison referred to him as our first black president. She actually changed her mind about that eventually. Um, people were excited about the fact that he asked Maya Angelou to be the first um, poet laureate, you know, because she was from Arkansas as well as he was. Um, he appointed Dr. Joycelyn Elders to be the Surgeon General. That didn't go so well. He ended up asking her to resign 18 months into it. 
Um, he also kind of played with the idea of Lonnie Guineer being his assistant attorney general for civil rights. She didn't even get a hearing, right? So that was all over the map. But one of the things that Clinton did here, and this is like the AP image that was in all the national newspapers, was he, he signed his Welfare to Work Act, and then this is the image that he put around him, which, as we know, in the Midwest, um, the primary beneficiaries of um, welfare don't actually look like this. But this was the image that went forth um, to make people incredibly resentful of welfare. And what he's doing is actually building on what Reagan had done, because Reagan was the first um, president to coin the term welfare queen. Those two words had never gone together before. It wasn't a notion. It wasn't a concept until he said that there was this woman in Chicago who had been a welfare cheat. Um, and he said that she'd robbed the city of $150,000. Um, and that actually was not true. And so this is uh, the climate that builds up to this moment. One of the questions I had to ask was, how do we get to Black Lives Matter when we have a black president, right? That was always um, somewhat troubling to me, just the timing of it. I couldn't imagine why that unfolded at that particular moment. I even felt some guilt about it because I was thinking that when I was in college, because I went to college during the Reagan Bush years, if there'd been a moment for Black Lives Matter, it should have been then, right? But we get get this um, in the midst of um, Obama. And one of the reasons why um, some scholars would argue that it happens at this moment is they say that you know racially, when Obama was in office for his first term, he really struggled in dealing with talking about contemporary race relations, particularly in the US, because he was torn being the first president. So I will lead up and say it's a joke, because I'm not sure if people will laugh. But folks will say that he was caught between Barack and a hard place, OK? <laughs> Thank you for that. I needed that. That was good. So this is an image of him having a beer summit after Henry Louis Gates, as we know, who taught at Harvard, was arrested in his own home. And this is the arresting officer. And then this is the vice president that Barack has had the bromance with, right? And so he, this is his response. And unfortunately, it was one of those things where a lot of black people didn't like the response. A lot of white people didn't like the response, right? So a lot of white people were like, you're going against the police, and that is going against public servants, and that's challenging and difficult. And a lot of black people said, well, what does it mean that you have come forward for one of the most wealthy, affluential, influential black people in America? So you know, you're not talking about water and Flint, right? You're not talking about working class black folks. You're going to like, you know, ride hard for Henry Louis Gates. And so that didn't go so well. Um, if you look at it, however, when Obama turns around his image for what he's done for black Americans, it's at this moment. It's the moment of Trayvon Martin. And this is when he comes forward um, on the, you know, garden where he had been sitting before and has a press conference and said, if I had a son, he'd look like Trayvon. I think all of us have some soul searching to figure out how does something like this happen? What does it mean? We need to examine the laws and the context for what has happened. And so briefly, because I want us to have time to have a conversation, I'll just say this is the moment. A lot of people ask, how long has Black Lives Matter been going on? What was the impetus? What was the precipitation? The impetus was essentially that when George Zimmerman was acquitted, you know, we had a racial divide. A lot of young people were shocked by this because this was the first time that they had seen this. Um, people of my generation remember OJ, remember Rodney King. This is not surprising to us that you have 86% of black folks upset and you only have 30% of white folks upset, right? Because we live in ways where we don't understand what other people are thinking. And so Black Lives Matter actually starts as a hashtag. It starts as a hashtag by these three um, young women who um, identify as feminist. Um, a few of them identify as queer, gender nonconforming. And they put out 5 million tweets when um, Zimmerman was um, not detained and said, essentially, you know, this is an outrage. Black Lives Matter. And so as we know, it moves from being in cyberspace to then when Michael Brown's body is laying on the ground. And so I think I want to wrap up here, because I want to have people just to be able to you know, interface and propose questions and all of that. And we can talk about what this means in St. Paul um, you know, in particular, or you know, Minnesota um, at large. And I just want to say that um, I appreciate 
you all giving me the time. And, um, you know, Tish, I will never follow you again. <laughs> this man here, sure. Yeah. No, Tony, Tony Morrison's the novelist. Um, um, she, she's just, she, um, she's not with the Southern Poverty Law Center. She actually wrote Sula and the Bluest Eye, and she, she won the Pulitzer. And um, you know, at the time, she was probably like the most well um, read and thought of like black woman in popular culture at the moment. So it was kind of like a blessing on Clinton um, that then she ended up revoking. Oh, I think it did probably with the Southern. Yeah. Southern. Yeah. Elite computers? Yeah, hidden computers. Hidden computers, yeah. So I'm the um, author of um, Hidden Human Computers, The Black Women of NASA. Um, and that's a family story. My grandmother was um, one of the first mathematicians at NASA. She was actually there um, 20 years before the movie Hidden Figures took place. And she worked with all the women in the movie. What's the name of the book? Hidden Human Computers, The Black Women of NASA. And we have um, a pl uh huh? That the, the movie was called Hidden Figures. Um, but we have um, a play called Hidden Heroes, which is um, going to be in Hopkins at Stages Theater April 26th to May 19th. Okay, yeah. To yeah. Someone else? Yes, in the back, if you could speak loudly. Sure, sure. Um, so the question was about um, Philando Castile. And in this part of the presentation, um, I was talking about how um, originally there was lots of resistance um, to Black Lives Matter. And um, in fact, I learned a lot from our elder Josie Johnson, who said, you know, don't be discouraged. There was even more resistance to the civil rights movement. And of course, she went to both the March on Washington and she was outside of the fourth precinct in Minneapolis. And so one of the things I said is that like once Philando Castile happened and when Dayton was governor and he said that he doubted that Castile would have been shot if he'd been white, as we all know, that was extremely controversial. There was a lot of pushback. A lot of people didn't like that he said that. Um, but what we do know, though, is that it was a changing moment for people that thought that um, these things happened those places, right? And I mean, I think that um, it was also a, a moment of reckoning for people um, because we judge victims. And um, Philando Castile was a good victim because people thought highly of him in a way that like other people um, have not been thought highly about. And it also happened um, in an area that people understood as safe. Um, and he worked at a school that people love. And, um, and so all of that, I think, was a um, changing moment um, for our state. Um, I think Jeff is standing up because you good people probably have to go back to work. Um, I'm on sabbatical. I don't have to do that. Um, so if you'd like to talk to me afterwards, that would be great. Uh, thank you so much. Well, thank you, Professor Harris. You did all right. Yeah. You did all right. <laughs> that was a great. That was a great talk. I wish we could. Uh, we had more time. But I wanted to uh, thank the people of the, the Black History Month Committee. Could you kind of wave your hands and all the people who've done all the hard work? Hey. And you know, we're hiring. You know, for people to join us, we have a lot of vacancies. This this, this work is 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 a labor of love, but we like to share the love. Uh, I'd also like to thank all of our speakers and performers. And I would uh, just want to thank the audience. Thank you guys for being here, taking time out of your busy days on a Friday to come hear a little bit, a very small amount, about our history. And I, I agree with Dr. Harris that it is ever evolving and we need to stay involved. So thank you for coming.